right, so my name is Sean Dehosky. I'm the Western Region Manager for PSS, uh, and we are the manufacturers of the temporary portable rumble strips known as Roadquake. Uh, I'd like to start off with just a little brief video for levity. Hopefully it, uh, it comes through uh, without too much interruption, uh, but uh, I think the audio will be clear, so it's, it's, it'll have a, the desired effect. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so didn't even see it. Uh, how can that happen? Uh, I don't know if anybody knows who Dr. Paul actually is, probably not, uh, but he is a neuropsychologist. He was with the University of Kansas, uh, but it seems that he's on faculty everywhere these days. Um, he has spent the past 25 years conducting research on cognitive factors related to driving. Um, and this is a study he did out of Canada. Uh, the little circle things you see on the dash are, um, they are eye pattern trackers. So they use an algorithm to track the eye patterns of the driver. The red box is where the driver's eyes uh, were scanning when he was paying full attention uh, to the roadway. The blue box is when the driver was paying attention to a cell phone. However, it wasn't, uh, he was not texting. Uh, he actually had both hands on the wheel and was um, paying attention to the roadway. All he had was a Bluetooth device in his ear and he was having a conversation. And that blue box shows where his eyes uh, scanned when he was just having a conversation on the phone. Uh, it's interesting and if you can look up Dr. Paul Ashley's presentations on uh, online and on YouTube, and I highly recommend doing so, they're very good. Um, but what he shows you is that when you're, when you're focusing on the roadway or when you're driving, we, we tend to overestimate the power of our peripheral vision. And he says, if you want to get an idea of where you actually can focus when you're driving, uh, put your fist out in front of your face at arm's length. And he goes, that's about the area you're able to focus on when you're driving. And so, uh, of course, in this scenario here, uh, he's not going to see this, the semi-truck that's stopped up ahead. Um, and so the conclusion of his study was actually that Drivers on cell phones are worse at driving than drunk drivers. Um, the phenomenon that Dr. Paul Ashley is always calling out is the fact that culture still has not caught up with the knowledge. Um, so with drunk driving, we've been preaching that drunk driving is wrong for the past uh, 20 or 30, 50 years even. Um, and so the, the culture has had a chance to catch up with the knowledge. Um, Whereas with cell phones and texting and driving, it hasn't. So if you had 100 people and you ask them, do you know that texting and driving is wrong? Of course, 100 of them would say, yes, I know it's wrong. And if you ask that same group of people, have you ever or do you text while you're driving? Um, about 99 of them would probably have to admit that they have at some point texted while driving. And so we know it's wrong, uh, and yet we still engage in the activity. And it's, uh, of course, um, a growing problem. This isn't going away. And as uh, as the head of the Tim Coalition in Nevada always says, he says, if it's predictable, it's preventable. And so that's where the rumble strips come in. Uh, the idea actually was not from us. Uh, the idea came organically from a project in Kansas in 2004 on US 50. Uh, there was a paving project and in one in that one work zone, in six weeks, they had nine fatalities. Uh, they didn't know what was going wrong. They didn't. They had all the signs up. They didn't know if it was uh, the sun glare on the windshield uh, or what was causing it. They actually came to us and said, uh, hey, can you, they were working with us at the time on something else. And they said, uh, can you guys invent something to be put in the roadway uh, to get drivers to look up and, and pay attention? And so we agreed. Uh, we went to work on it for about a year and came up with uh, the first prototype version of what we call the rumble strip. And at that point, it was some chain link together map system. Uh, long story short, they put that out on the roadway. A car hit it at 65 miles an hour, did fine. Then a semi truck came and threw it down the road 100 yards. So that wasn't going to work. A few years, we went back to the drawing board for about three years uh, and came up with another product. And uh, it was a urethane product. 
And uh, at that time we were doing testing on another work zone with it, uh, but it was in the cold. And so a uh, state traffic engineer was out there. Our engineer was out there. And for eight hours, semis went over it at 65 miles an hour, uh, passenger vehicles. Um, and for eight hours, they did great. Uh, but at the end of the day, because of the cold, when they went to put them in into the truck bed, they crumbled. And of course, we were uh, embarrassed. And um, But to our surprise, the state traffic engineer came up to us and said, uh, that problem can be fixed. But what that was doing in the roadway today was saving lives. So can you please go back to work on that product? So we said, okay. And so uh, for three more years, we uh, conducted more trials, uh, talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in R&D and um, thousands of test, tests and trials. And we finally came up with uh, the first version of what we call Roadquake today. And so seven years after that first project, there was another um, a work zone on that same stretch of US 50 in Kansas. And for six months, they deployed the rumble strips on that work zone. And in six months, they had zero fatalities, zero crashes, uh, and they didn't even have uh, a fender bender. So we don't claim to be fixing stupid. Uh, if somebody wants to get drunk and plow into a, into a work zone, we can't stop that from happening. Uh, but we, what we can do is get drivers to look up from their cell phones and to pay attention uh, to their surroundings. So what is a temporary portable rumble strip? It is an audible kinetic and visual alert system to improve driver behavior. So uh, a lot of people look at the rumble strips and think speed bumps. Um, technically speaking, the primary function of the rumble strips is not speed reduction. It is uh, driver performance um, enhancement. However, uh, there is, as you'll see, as we'll see later on, there is a secondary effect of the rumble strips that does uh, naturally cause a reduction in speed. Uh, they're 11 feet long and they weigh 105 pounds. Uh, basically what they are is that they are a series of steel bars glued into um, a highly engineered polymer. Uh, so it's it looks like rubber, uh, but it's not. It's an engineered polymer that uh, refracts energy when it's impacted instead of rebounding energy. And so it reduces the bouncing effect or rather eliminates the bouncing effect of the strips in the roadway while also protecting uh, vehicles from uh, exposing them to metal bars that are embedded inside. Uh, the top of the rumble strip has a beveled edge on both sides uh, to allow for motorcycles to safely traverse uh, the rumble strips. And they only use dead weight. So uh, the polymer and the um, characteristics of how it behaves along with its weight are what keep the rumble strips uh, in relative position. So there's no glue, no nails, um, nothing needed to fasten them down to the roadway. So here's a, a short video that uh, hopefully you can see it, uh, that does a good job of explaining what the rumble strips do and what their function is. Notice uh, from outside of the vehicle, you can hear the cars going over the strips. Uh, so the crews in Arizona tell me all the time that they love, that's their favorite part about the strips is when they're working, they can hear the cars coming as they approach their work zone. Um, Arizona has had a lot of problems with um, cars coming in hot into their work zones. And so uh, that's their favorite aspect is they can hear the cars approaching. Uh, this is where Roadquake is used globally. Uh, it's used in Canada, Chile, the United Kingdom, France, Switzerland, Denmark, Australia, and Malaysia. In the US, uh, all of the gold states there uh, are showing where it is approved uh, in the United States. And then these are the states that have uh, decided to require its use given certain conditions. So uh, in these states, certain conditions will trigger uh, its required use. Uh, so it's not that they are 
uh, required to be used in every situation. Uh, but for example, in Texas, if they are doing a lane closure or a flagging operation, uh, they're, re they're required to use the rumble strips. In California, uh, it's just flagging operations in rural areas uh, where the speed is above 45 miles per hour. Uh, and they're out there for four hours or longer. And then of course there are stipulations where they don't have to use them. So if it's snowing or if it's emergency work, uh, then they don't have to use the rumble strips. So it's not a requirement across the board, but uh, based on certain conditions that trigger, uh, that trigger its requirement. Um, well, I might I ask, is that by like state law or is that by uh, the policy of the Department of Transportation or what? That's, that's determined by the DOT. Um, I see. Yep. So it would be then for contracts and for their internal use. Correct. So uh, in the states uh, where they don't have requirements, you know, they're just doing it on a case by case basis um, and, and writing it in contracts. Um, and then this would be, you know, the ones where they're requiring it is at, at the state level. They're um, making it a standard practice for certain scenarios. Thank you. You're welcome. Hope that answers that question. Uh, Texas was one of the first states uh, to, well, was the first state to require its use. Um, just a little backstory on Texas. In 2013, I think they had one of the highest fatality rates in the country. They had that year, I think they had 200, about 240 fatalities in their work zones. And uh, at that time, we'd, we were pretty far along in the development of Roadquake, and we sent them literally hundreds of strips to test for a year. Uh, and then they reported back to us the following year. And when they did, they told us, they said, we had a, we've been using your strips and we had a 40% increase in our fatality rate. And we kind of scratched our head and said, well, what happened? We thought you were using the strips. And they said, we were. Uh, all of those fatalities happened where we weren't using the rumble strips. Anywhere where we were using your product, we had no problems. Uh, and so it was after that test that they uh, issued that requirement statewide for flagging and, and lane and lane drops across the state. Um, at, uh, at an ATSA shortly, shortly thereafter, um, somebody from the Texas DOT came up to David Cowan, our, our CEO, and he said, I, I want to thank you, sir. And, he, and our president said, well, sorry, you're, you're our biggest customer. I should be thanking you. Uh, and he says, no, it's my job when there's been a fatality to notify families. And wherever we've been using your product, I haven't had to make that call. Uh, so I want to thank you. Uh, so it's a pretty good testament to the effectiveness of the product. Um, Iowa just about five years ago uh, started uh, requiring their use. And uh, actually last year at ATSO, they came up to our vice president, Dave McKee, and, uh, and they said, you know, uh, before we started implementing your rumble strips in our work zones, we could bet on a, on, a, on a flagger fatality every year. It was like clockwork. Every year we would lose one or two flaggers. And he said, since we started requiring your rumble strips five years ago, we haven't lost a single flagger. Um, there's one more story I'll share out of Nevada that just, uh, I was on the phone with the chief operations engineer just a couple of weeks ago. And he said to me, he said, Sean, I swear to you uh, that since we've started using your rumble strips, uh, we're starting to use them everywhere, lane closures and flagging on the interstates. He says, since we've been using your rumble strips, uh, we have not had one single fatal in any of our queuings, not one. And he said that we were, they were having quite a few there for a while before they were using the rumble strips. Uh, so we know they work. We know they save lives. Uh, it's a because it's a preventative measure. We'll never know how many lives uh, that we are saving. Um, but you know, it's not flashy. It's not Bluetooth at least yet. Um, but uh, but it works. It's simple and it and it works. Uh, so this is our recommended standard drawing for a flagging operation. Uh, so just to go over a couple of details here, uh, you'll notice two arrays of three strips in advance of the flagger. Uh, so just a little bit of rationale as to why two arrays and why three strips. So uh, both arrays serve a dual purpose. So that first array uh, that the driver would go over serves as the initial warning, of course, for the driver uh, that conditions are about to change. And then the second array is the reminder to the driver um, that something is changing. Uh, now that second array uh, also serves as an audible alert for the flagger and the workers in the work zone. So 
usually that's the one they'll hear the cars going over and but depending on the road geometry sometimes they can hear the cars going over both arrays uh, depending on how they have it set up um, so then if there is a queue backed up over that second array that first array that the drivers go over that becomes the primary array in the system uh, to alert drivers so that's the reasoning for two arrays um, we've i've seen uh, drawings from dot's where they have three arrays four arrays um, but we found two to be the um, sort of the sweet spot in terms of uh, effectiveness and what's needed. Uh, the reason for three strips, again, we did, you know, we've done testing with one or two strips um, and we, we've done projects where we've had four or five, seven strips out there. Um, our fear with one or two strips was that if it's only one strip or two strip, it's not a uh, familiar but dump 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 sound, it's not uniform. And so the driver might think they hit something that wasn't intended to be there, like a road gator or a dog or something. So we don't want them looking back over their shoulder. So uh, it also gives that visual cue that these are intended to be there. Um, five, seven, we didn't see any uh, increased effectiveness with more strips than three. So we found three again to be that, uh, that nice uh, middle ground between um, overkill and, and what's effective. Um, the other nice thing about this is it's kind of created a standard now uh, across the country. Uh, it's a familiar number now, it's a familiar sound when you go over the strips, that familiar but dump but dump but dump sound is a uniform experience for the road user, no matter what state they go into. So um, we've kind of adopted three as our, as our standard. This is our standard drawing for uh, lane closures on divided highways. Um, so you'll see two arrays adjacent to each other in both lanes. Some states will drop one of the arrays in the second array. Um, that's again up to the up to the engineering uh, engineering team of that DOT. So this is California's standard drawing uh, for their flagging operations. Um, so you'll see the two arrays of three in advance of each flagger. And that's pretty pretty standard. This is Texas DOT's standard drawing. This is so on the left is their flagging drawing, then on the on the right is their um, their lane closure. You'll notice that in the fast lane, they, they dropped one of the arrays. Uh, their, their thought process there is that it uh, helps facilitate the zipper effect uh, better. Um, so. Uh, so Utah adopted the same drawing from Texas. So they dropped that second array there as well for their lane closures. Uh, Utah is using them on, on their interstates. They use it on I-80. And then Massachusetts uh, actually only uses them on multi-lane facilities. And you'll notice in Massachusetts, they've placed the rumble strips within, uh, within the, well, adjacent to the taper as opposed to in advance of it. Um, I think they do deploy them in advance as well. I think that's optional, uh, but uh, they wanted to maintain driver's attention as, as they were going through the work zone. So the rumble strips can be used pretty much anywhere workers, worker safety is a, is a uh, concern. So usually they're used in short duration work zones, uh, but they have been used in 24 seven applications. Uh, it's just important that if they are, that they're being monitored around the clock every four to six hours. Uh, so I've had people come to me saying that the, they, come, they came back in the morning and the strips were moved a couple feet uh, into the other lane of travel. Okay, first of all, that's not that big of a deal. Um, because the strips are, are, are designed to be impacted. Um, but uh, that excessive movement is of course, because they were not out there checking them. So it, it had been 12 hours since they were last uh, monitored. Um, but flagging, pilot car operations, lane closures, and then Nevada uh, for a while was using them as a um, condition for re um, requesting a reduced speed limit in a work zone. So if they were reducing speeds, and they had to use the rumble strips. Uh, any vehicles, any, any temperatures, uh, any speeds. So uh, temperatures from zero to 180 degrees, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, speeds up to 80 miles an hour. Um, we just don't wanna condone speeding any higher than that. So of course vehicles can go over them faster than 80 miles an hour. Um, heavy trucks, buses, motorcycles, bicycles, wheelchairs, you name it. Uh, so do they work? So the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission uh, wanted to test the effectiveness of 
uh, road quake with a trooper sitting on the side of the road with his with his lights on. And uh, I'll just cover from this study. Any of these studies we go over, by the way, I can always send them to you, so feel free to ask. Um, but they were looking at two criteria. Uh, they were looking at speed reduction and then vehicle merge behavior. So how far in advance of the taper vehicles merged over. So this was the drawing for the project. Uh, you'll see the setup there similar to Texas and Utah's standard drawing. So on the top, it shows what uh, at, on that on those dates, what the average speed was during uh, through this work zone, and the average speed was 61 miles per hour. Uh, when they used the rumble strips on a different date, they found that the average speed was five miles per hour less, and they found similar results with the trooper with his lights on. So, uh, trooper not present, average speed was 54 miles per hour, and then with the trooper present, it was 49 miles per hour. So, pretty similar findings there with speed reduction. Where it gets interesting is with driver merge behavior. Uh, so with just with no countermeasure in place, drivers were merging about 300 feet in advance of the taper. Uh, with the rumble strips, they were merging 700 feet. And with the trooper, they were merging 600 feet. So the rumble strips actually edged out the trooper by 100 feet there uh, on that one. And so of course, the conclusion of that study was that more uh, more consideration should be given to the rumble strips uh, as a as a uh, as another another countermeasure to be used alongside troopers. This is now uh, this was in 2015, I believe. Uh, TTI did a study examining the uh, end of queue systems, uh, two end of queue systems, rumble strips, and the icon icon system. What they found was that uh, with these two systems in place. They, they found a 44% reduction in crashes that would have otherwise occurred uh, when queuing was expected. Uh, the next year, they went back, so in 2016, and they tested these two systems separately. And actually what they found was that with the rumble strips just by themselves, um, they had more Bluetooth technology. They were doing a little bit more specific uh, testing this time, so they were able to get better data. Uh, they found that the rumble strips indicated a 60% reduction in expected crashes. Uh, so the big question, of course, is since they're not fastened, uh, they're not glued, do they move? And of course, the answer is yes. So there's nothing keeping these things glued down to the road. So uh, this is important to have the right expectations about uh, what movement looks like. Um, the University of Kansas did an objective study to develop a specification for the Kansas DOT uh, and really for all DOTs across the country to use. Um, Ultimately, they developed a matrix to classify rumble strips based on their performance so that other DOTs um, testing any future products could run them through these paces and uh, develop their specifications around these performance metrics as opposed to just the physical characteristics of the strips. Uh, Kansas DOT wanted to be able to use the rumble strips uh, on an interstate with uh, about 50% truck traffic. So they took the strips out on a, on a racetrack uh, that had a similar pavement surface to the roadway. Uh, this was the dump truck that they used. They also used a passenger vehicle, but for the purposes of this presentation to keep it short, uh, we'll just go over the extreme conditions that were tested. So um, at 67 miles per hour, uh, they assumed an ADT of truck traffic to be 3,000, um, and then, or sorry, average daily traffic 3,000, 50% truck traffic, um, and in that time, so in a, in a work zone, uh, in a working window, they wouldn't want the strips to rotate more than 26 degrees. And so uh, assuming uh, for four hours, then trucks, about 670 trucks would go over the strips. So for a total of 670 truck passes, they don't want them to rotate more than 26 degrees. Then doing simple math uh, for 40 truck passes on a racetrack to save some time, uh, they didn't want the strips to rotate more than a degree and a half. So uh, they were testing the two products at the time that were on the market, and that was our real quick 2F strips and then the competitive product, which will remain nameless uh, during this presentation. Uh, but you'll see uh, that uh, at all speeds with the truck passes, uh, real quick never rotated more than a degree and a half. 
Um, the other product only qualified at the lowest speed, which was two, 22 miles per hour. Um, they also wanted to test uh, the di displacement of the strips. Uh, and so again, using the same logic for 40 truck passes, they didn't want the strips to move more than a half an inch. And you'll see there at the highest speed of 67 miles per hour, uh, Roadquake never, never moved more than a half an inch out of place. Um, and then the other product moved at most 29, 29 inches. And I don't say this to dog any other products, but just to stress uh, the how hard it is to develop a product that can withstand impacts from 80, 80 000 pound vehicles going 80 miles an hour um, and again this is just on a test track and so of course reality is always different than, than testing um, and things are even more extreme in real life so um, it's not uh, it's not an easy easy feat to accomplish um, so it's important that any future product is is tested um, when it is presented. This is the matrix that they ultimately ended up uh, developing. So they, the conclusion of the study was that Roadquake uh, qualified as a class one rumble strip. So they developed four different classes of rumble strips uh, based on the test results. Uh, the competitive product ranked as a class four. So it was only uh, rated for speeds of 22 miles an hour uh, and below, and then lower ADTs. Uh, the conclusion of a class one uh, rated rumble strip is that it can be used basically all ADTs and any any speeds. Uh, so this is our best practices uh, guidebook. It is an entirely comprehensive uh, booklet that covers everything from uh, deployment and retrieval, spacing, uh, movement allowances, maintenance, um, even proper handling techniques, uh, when to tell when the, the product is at the end of its life. Um, every, any question that you could have is in this booklet. So it's a great uh, field reference uh, for workers in the field. And uh, just uh, feel free to email me and I can always send you hard copies of this or a PDF version of it as well. Uh, but to go back to the question of movement, yes, the strips do move. Uh, it's a bit like watching grass grow. So if you're watching the strips, you're not likely to see them moving. Uh, but if you come back an hour or two later, you will see that they've moved a few inches, uh, even maybe a couple of feet, depending on the, uh, the road surface. Um, it's not a problem. It doesn't, pose, uh, it doesn't pose any risk for the road user. It doesn't change the performance of the strips. Um, it's just a little aesthetically displeasing. Uh, it can be can be uh, shocking if you're not expecting it. So if you if your if your expectation is that these do not move, then even if they're moved six inches, it's going to look like they're moving a lot. Um, so it's just good to have the right expectations. Three feet, you know, this really this would depend on the road surface. Normal movement after four or six hours is you know six to eight inches of displacement. Um, but you know if it's heavy ADT and there's heavy truck traffic, yeah, there might be there might be three feet of movement. Um, it's not a big deal. Um, if you see this movement, uh, when you, upon monitoring the strips, simply wait for a natural break in traffic or conduct another rolling stop like you did when you deployed them, uh, and then just simply reposition it back into place. Sometimes, depending on the cross slope of the roadway, you might see lateral movement. And then this movement, of course, uh, the perpendicular movement. Uh, you're not really going to see unless you've marked the pavement. Uh, usually this happens uniformly. Um, the only time you might see it, notice this is if it's in a high ADT, high speed facility and the strips are not spaced uh, far enough apart. And we'll talk about spacing, but um, this movement is, is totally natural. So what we were finding in higher speed, higher ADT applications was that the center strip uh, was moving more than the other two strips. So that middle strip would be sometimes closer to that top strip uh, after inspection, after four hours. And we were curious as to why this was. So we, we took a high-speed camera out and we uh, watched the strips. And what we found was that uh, when empty trailers were going over the strips, uh, the axle was rebounding off of the first strip and then landing uh, back down on top of that second strip, causing it to shift more. So what we did, we used to space the strips out at only three or five feet, uh, and then we, you know, spaced them out to 10 feet. Um, but this, at 10 feet, we were seeing this happen. So uh, we actually 
decided to space them out to 35 feet in higher speed applications. Uh, so for 65 miles an hour and over um, on interstates, uh, we're spacing the strips at 35 feet uh, or even 40 feet now. And that has completely eliminated that, uh, that phenomenon. Uh, so this is a picture. This is exciting. Uh, we've seen this enough times now uh, where people will deploy the strips upside down. So uh, if I ever get a call about excessive movement, it's one of a few things. It's either A, they're not spaced out far enough from each other, um, or, or B, it's uh, they're deployed incorrectly. And uh, if it's excessive, then it's basically a sure thing that they've deployed them upside down. Uh, I've gone out to work zones where uh, the workers were saying that they were moving all over the place. Uh, and then I said, well, uh, did you have them upside down? And then I get the response, wait, there's a bottom? Uh, so yes, there is a bottom. Uh, and the bottom is flat as opposed to the top. So uh, because the top is tapered for motorcycles to go over them safely, uh, if they're deployed upside down, then they act as a teeter-totter. Uh, so they, they can move excessively. So to prevent that from happening in the future, we've now added in a red polymer stripe on the bottom of all of our strips and uh, engraved on the bottom of them this side down in four different places. Um, and then on the brackets, uh, on the underside of the brackets, there are stickers also in both English and in Spanish uh, that state this side down. So um, we have not had any incidents uh, we have not had any instances of that happening since we've implemented these changes. So uh, this has been this has been good. Uh, so obviously there are there are not uh, there are times where the rumble strips are not ideal. Um, so we don't say that these should be used absolutely everywhere, though they are effective in ninety percent of situations. Uh, but there are there are instances where we would say you know that's not the right use for them. So obvious ones are you know surfaces with a fresh seal coat gravel roads, uh, soft pavement, uh, unless you want permanent rumble strips, then there you go. Uh, heavily rutted roadways, you know, this would be judgment. Um, you always want to try to find a section of the roadway where the um, connection between the rumble strip and the roadway is going to be greatest. So um, if that's not possible, then you might consider not using them there. Bleeding asphalt. Try to avoid that. Uh, we don't say that you cannot use them on bridge decks. Uh, we just uh, recommend that you monitor them a lot more frequently. So there is a bridge uh, in Rhode Island with a project going on on it, and it's still going on. It's been going on for the past two years, and they are using Roadquake on the bridge deck um, to keep drivers from being distracted by the sheer beauty of the view from up on this bridge. Uh, it's one of the tallest bridges I'm told in Rhode Island. Uh, and I guess the, the views are spectacular. So people get distracted looking around. Um, the strips move a lot. And for the past two years, they have had uh, a person that is specifically designated to monitor the rumble strips every, I think it's either hour or every two hours. Uh, and then they're, they're moving them back. So uh, the effects of those strips were worth it to them to, uh, to commit somebody every two hours for the past two years, 24 seven. Uh, but uh, so uh, if that's not feasible, then we recommend just deploying the strips um, on the roadway in advance of the, of the bridge if possible. Uh, scarified roads, same thing. Uh, you can deploy them uh, where the road is scarified, but you are gonna see excessive movement. So again, uh, just adjust your, your monitoring intervals. And uh, we don't give specific guidance for road geometry, but we do recommend avoiding deploying them uh, in the middle of a curve. Uh, this is also for the safety of the workers deploying them. You, won't, you always want to have a, a safe line of sight um, in both directions when you're deploying strips. So um, try to find a stretch of the roadway that's straight. And then, uh, you know, typically more than four or five percent uh, is going to be a little extreme for the strips. They can be used, but again, you're going to have excessive movement. So you'll want to make sure you're checking them more often if you're deploying them on an, on an incline or decline. 
so one product improvement that we recently made that's worth mentioning uh, is our, our new um, hinge system. It's our breakaway feature. So the older version, let me back up. The current version of Roadquake is in its, I believe, 84th now revision since the inception of the product. Uh, and so every little detail of this strip plays a part in how it performs and how it functions. Uh, you'll notice different grooves, for example, on the bottom of the strip. If you were to look at the top, you would see a different groove pattern. Um, the bottom grooves help facilitate uh, moisture whisking away to help adhesion to the roadway. The top groove patterns help motorcycles uh, go over them safely. Um, so every little detail plays a role. Uh, they used to be held together by metal chain links. Um, but in about 1% of cases, if there was a high torsion event or an extreme kind of impact uh, or from just uh, use over time, uh, those metal links could tear through the tabs. As you see on the left there, those tabs have that tear through them. And then on the right was a customer that tried to uh, hold them together still with a wire. Uh, so to prevent this from happening in the future, uh, we changed out the metal links with these new nylon pins. And these are designed to give way before that uh, part of the polymer does. So instead of having to replace an entire rumble strip, now you just replace a, a little 50 cent pin um, and you're good to go. And this is, uh, this is we've received really great feedback uh, from this change in the field. And so that's what they look like now. So we've talked about the rumble strips and how much they weigh. Uh, they weigh 105 pounds and they're 11 feet long. So as you can imagine, they are awkward to handle and kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, so to make handling a lot easier, uh, back in 2015, we developed what we called the crib. And uh, this holds six of the rumble strips. So it's enough to hold uh, two arrays. Um, and so uh, it has rollers on the side of it. I'll play a video here. But the nice thing about this is uh, whenever you're pulling the rumble strips out of the crib, of course, it's uh, you've got gravity on your side, so it's easy, but even pulling them back into the crib, you're only lifting uh, 35, maybe 40 pounds the most uh, to put these away. And a person, one worker, uh, can now deploy three of these strips in about 90 seconds. Um, so it takes a lot of the strain off. So hopefully this video will play. And I'll fast forward it here. By 14 inches high. The crib is powder coated in safety yellow. We've added reflective safety tape to three sides to make sure crib is highly visible to nighttime drivers. Crib easily mounts to a receiver using the adjustable pintle mount included with each crib. When mounted, crib doesn't interfere with the tailgate or tail lights. You don't have to make room in your already crowded service vehicle. Crib sits lower than the vehicle bed meaning there is less effort involved when adding or removing Roadquake 2F temporary portable rumble strips. Crib carries up to six Roadquake 2F strips. That's enough to lay down two three-strip arrays. Adjustable straps, also included with Crib, assure that all of the strips are safe and secure when transported. You can see that Crib looks great. Wait until you see what this baby can do. The stainless steel rollers located on each side allow road break to have strips to literally roll out of the crib. Deploying temporary portable rumble strips is now as easy as one, two, three. Unfold, pull, position. Crib is deployment ready. It holds road quake to have strips perpendicular to the road. So you can deploy them right across the lane without having to reposition the strips or your truck. And it's almost as easy to retrieve and return deployed strips back to crib. Thanks to crib, what was once a two person operation can now be done with one worker easily, safely, and in less time. Road quake to. Uh, so that crib can also be mounted to the front of the truck. Uh, that's how Virginia DOT uh, mounts them. That's a Virginia DOT truck there. Um, we have sense, uh, well, so that crib uh, is 800 pounds when it's fully loaded. Uh, so instead of removing each rumble strip uh, from the crib in order to take the crib off the back of the truck, uh, we invented what we call a quick detach feature, which allows you to take it off with a forklift. <laughs>
so we've recently made some upgrades to that crib and now that quick de quick detach feature is integrated into the crib itself as are the uh, ratchet straps um, and then there's also a little uh, container on the side there as well for pamphlets and uh, extra pins uh, and now we do have three different cribs uh, crib six which is the yellow one and crib nine which holds nine strips the blue one and then the black one which holds 12 uh, rumble strips uh, that black one would be uh, permanently mounted to a larger vehicle, of course. So there's a picture of the Crib XL on the back of a bigger truck. And then uh, that orange box you see on the left there is uh, the remote retrieval system. Uh, it's basically a winch motor uh, with a, uh, that basically pulls in the rumble strips using remote control uh, right into the crib. Uh, so taking away even that, uh, that 35 or 40, 40 pound lift. And then our latest uh, innovation is, of course, uh, the Raptor uh, rumble strip handling machine. Um, this allows the driver of the vehicle to deploy the rumble strips from within the safety of the cab of the vehicle. Uh, so nobody has to get out of the vehicle or, or get into the lane of travel to deploy the strips. Um, and it can put down uh, three strips again in about 90 seconds. So here's a, here's a video on this. For more than 30 years, EPSS has worked to design and manufacture innovative safety products that protect workers, drivers, and pedestrians while in the roadway. One of our greatest innovations is the roadway safety system of temporary portable rumble strips and the accessory that help with transportation, deployment, and retrieval. The key component of the system is Roadway 2F. Our temporary portable rumble strips have an extra level of detection of road zones and has quickly become an important safety countermeasure for DOTs and contractors across the country. The safest and easiest way to transport, deploy, and retrieve real quick strips is with Raptor, rumble strip handling machine. Raptor protects workers by keeping them out of traffic and away from moving vehicles. Raptor is a one-person operation with the driver using a simple remote control to deploy and retrieve real quick strips, all from the safety of the cab. Raptor stores and transports up to 12 strips at a time, enough for four three strip arrays. Raptor is fast, deploying a three strip array in less than 90 seconds. Once strips are deployed, they can easily realign any units that may become skewed over time. Raptor easily retrieves an array of real quick rumble strips in less than two and a half minutes. Raptor mounts at the front of vehicles with at least a 3,000 pound front axle capacity. Raptor's quick detach mechanism attaches to a front-mounted DIN plate, allowing it to be easily moved as needed between vehicles. The wireless remote control allows users to control all of the functions of Raptor one-handed, including lowering Raptor arms, deploying strips, controlling lateral movement of the arms, realigning and retrieving strips, and returning Raptor arms to transport mode. Raptor is the safest and most efficient way to deploy and retrieve road brakes to have temporary portable rumble strips. To learn more about the entire family of Roadway products, or to schedule your own Raptor demonstration, contact David McKee or visit us online at pss-innovations.com. And that's all I've got for you right now. Uh, so thank you all for your time. I really appreciate you uh, joining us today and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll put my video back on here. <clears throat> All right, do we have any uh, questions from the crowd? Please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Hey, Michael McGee, uh, City of Portland. If you got the, I know that this is obviously a more of a higher speed interstate type application, but do you have anything that's more in an urban? setting or has there been any studies about that about that's either effectiveness or uh, just some advantages maybe that are specific to an urban setting yeah just anecdotal um there uh, in here in california there are actually counties that use them um i believe what in arterial roads um but uh usually it's it's on interstates and rural areas but they are rated for speeds anywhere from zero, you know, 25 miles an hour up to, to 80 miles an hour. So 
Um, it would definitely be uh, a countermeasure that could be used anywhere. <clears throat> and to kind of speak to that too, from just my opinion, um, you know, being in cities, that's where the low speed areas tends to be where I see a lot of people doing it on their cell phones. So, I mean, it almost seems like it would be more effective in, uh, in a city uh, or just as effective in a city environment with how many people, you know, when they're hitting that 25 mile an hour zone, they're not so worried about being in an accident. So they look down at their phone to do whatever. And, you know, somebody stops short or a work zone comes up. And this is the kind of thing that would, you know, get their head away from their cell phone to look up and, and see what's going on. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll just, my thought where I'm thinking is that we definitely have a lot more distracting. Uh, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of distraction, there's a lot of zones. Uh, and then a lot of times we're there and then we're not there. So when we are there, we really need it. We can have this added awareness when we're actually there. Uh, I could see some adding to value, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's another good point. Being in the city, there's a lot of stuff to look at. Whereas on the highway, you're kind of just driving. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. So, <clears throat> um, is there anybody else that has any other questions? No, oh, that was a, a lot of good information there. And Sean, I thank you for, for covering that so well. Oh, again, thank you all for your attendance and, and attention. Uh, again, please feel free to reach out to me or Ryan with any, any questions. Uh, if anybody wants any of those studies that I that I briefly went over, uh, I can always send those to you. We have a lot more as well. Uh, I just didn't, didn't share them for brevity's sake. So um, I have a lot of a lot of uh, a lot I can share with anyone who's interested. Yeah. Oh, another question. Sorry. Uh, on, on that tr that track study, was that a flat track or do you know, was it a uh, slope track or what the cross slope of that was? Or did that, do you know if that was a factor? I know you're trying to evaluate movement. I'm just wondering for us that it would be that more lateral movement for urban, you know, because it speeds volumes, it'd be more of that lateral movement to the side as opposed to. Yeah, my, my understanding was that it was a flat track. Okay. Um, just because they were trying to, they were trying to duplicate the um, uh, real world, the conditions of the highway that they wanted to use these on. So even like the, the pavement friction coefficient was was similar. So, okay. Um, All right. I uh, just wanted to show our uh, contact information here again. So uh, Damien had to jump off. He had a he had another engagement. He had to jump onto really quick. So. Um, but you guys got to meet him. Here's his information. Again, he does Washington and Alaska. Um, my contact information, I do Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And then um, you can also contact Sean and we can work together on things. I just wanted to add as well too, um, uh, we have partnered with Coral. Uh, and so they're able to help us now with, with our training. Uh, training is very important uh, with the rumble strips. Uh, you know, we thought we think things are pretty simple. Uh, it seems like a simple concept until you get in the real world and then people start deploying them upside down uh, and all their other craziness. So um, training is important and we, myself and Ryan are more than happy to ever come out uh, and, uh, and train your crews. And uh, we're also happy to come out and give a, give a demonstration of the product in a, in a real world uh, work zone as well. So um, especially, you know, of course, COVID. Yeah, please reach out to us if you'd like um, further training or if you would like to you know, once you once anybody purchased these we will we'll be offering that kind of that kind of a service to to come out and demo them for you to show you how to properly deploy and and uh retrieve these things and um go through the manual and stuff with you um i did want to quickly bring up i know we're kind of out of time here but uh coffee with coral is um mostly a weekly event um except for holiday weeks so we have one more next week that's going to be on the um, dual side fire radar system from Houston Radar called the Speed. And then our next one won't be until January 7th after that because of the Christmas holiday. 
Um, and then we will be covering our uh, mass attenuators from uh, Trinity Highway. And I believe he's also gonna give a brief presentation on what MASH is at the beginning of that as kind of a refresher for uh, people who have not been exposed to that yet. And then on the 14th, we'll be doing our driver feedback signs from Ford Tell. Um, do also want to say that you can um, sign up for our newsletter and any future Coffee with Coral announcements. Um, Show you that here on our website. So if you just go to coralsales.com. Um, so this is our, our uh, headline page here. If you scroll down to the monthly newsletter, there's a link here to uh, sign up for the newsletter, which will also automatically sign you up to receive the Coffee with Coral announcements. We're not going to bombard you with emails. You'll get one email a month for the newsletter and one, maybe two emails a week for the Coffee with Coral, just as reminders. Uh, to sign up for those. Um, with that, if there are no more questions, uh, let me ask that. Are there any other questions? Did anybody come up with anything last minute? I see you trying to talk. Can you maybe put your question in the chat box? Or are you just saying thank you? Oh, I have a request. Oh, this is Michael again. Uh, I have a request. Can I get a copy of that presentation or to share with our safety committee, especially those slides that has those uh, kind of speed recommendations, I guess, is what I'm really... Sean, are you willing to, to share that presentation? Yes, absolutely. Um, Michael, can you if you want to send it to me, then I... We'll, uh, I'll figure out how to get over to you, Michael. Um, yeah, probably have to get some kind of Dropbox or something because I'm sure it's probably a, a large file. Let's just, actually, Sean, can you PDF it? Well, well, Michael, were you asking, sorry, forgive me, were you asking for this presentation I just gave or were you asking for a specific, specific part of the presentation? Well, I, I'm, I'm anticipating that they're going to um, go onto your website. You know, I have, we have a safety committee and then they're going to. Whereas if I can get them right to that one that has a, the lower speed, you know, urban, where they applicable to the urban, where they can connect the dots. Okay. Um, and then Thanks I know we'd, be, we'd also be interested in that, uh, I forget what you call it, but the, the trailer mounted or the hitch mounted deployment piece, because obviously with labors and back injuries, that's always an issue for us. But. Yes. Um. So whatever whatever is yep. easiest to share, but I know that's the two things that you know. If it's already available on your website, then great. But, uh, okay. I think those slides that had those speed uh, applications and recommendations, you know, best practices, that would be really okay. Helpful yeah, I asked just speed. because I know I know this is being reported, so um, I don't know if the video version of this presentation would, would work, or if you wanted the uh, the PDF of the studies, I can send you anything you want. So. Uh, we can we can connect after this and I can get you get you everything. Yeah, I think the PDFs would be great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to go through after this and we'll edit the video um, to try and, and keep people's privacy and things like that. Um, and then we will actually release this um, onto our uh, website. Thank you. For future for future years. So, all right. Um, Sounds like uh, we got everything concluded here. Again, I appreciate everyone's attendance and uh, appreciate your questions. Sean, appreciate your great presentation there. Again, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to contact us at Coral Sales and we will get you the information that you need and uh, whatever else you'd like. Um, thank you everyone and have a great day and hope to see you on future Coffee with Corals. Thank you.